Let's talk tourism. Jake Alexander is originally from Greenwich, Connecticut, but has spent his recent years in the jungles of Capos. He's owned a fishing boat, sold luxury travel, and today, vacation rental technology. But more recently, he's the host of a unique YouTube show on inspiring expat stories. Jake, let's talk tourism. Let's do it. The, Did I get uh, close to that intro? Close to right? Uh, I'm from Wilton, Connecticut, but the Damn rest it. of it's not a good. Damn it. <laughs> Okay. All right. It's all part of it. Connecticut's such a weird state, right? Because you have parts of it that are so amazing and then parts that are like, don't slow down. Right. Yeah, like Bridgeport. Yes. So anyway, let's go back to the origin story, Jake. What first brought you to Costa Rica and when was that? Yeah, so when I was in high school, they had an internship program where you could get out of school six weeks early. So I did an internship program with the tree company that have worked at my parents' house since we moved there, you know, 18 years ago at that point. Okay. And uh, all the guys that I worked with were Costa Rican. So that's what introduced me to Costa Rica was working with these guys for that summer. And then the summer after my freshman year of college, and I can't remember... Well, the first time I came down here was 2010. So that would have been during my freshman year of college. And uh, they live up in the mountains outside Perez del Adon. Wow. In a little, little pueblo of, you know, maybe 100 families called Santa de Vies. And so that's when I first came to Costa Rica was to visit them. That is true rural Costa Rica. And, and, yeah. how, long, and how long did you do that for? Uh, so I did the tree work for two summers and I came down to visit them a handful of times. Uh, and the first time I came down to visit them, uh, I actually found, I'll see if I can find it. I'll send it to you. But the a picture of the piece of paper with handwritten directions and some phone numbers on it on my instructions of what to do once I landed, because I, I lied to my parents and told them that my friends were coming to pick me up at the airport. But in reality, it was like, get a taxi to Tracopa, find the Tracopa bus to San Isidro, and like, that's where we'll meet you. That was a long, <laughs> that was a long bus ride back then, yeah? Yeah, so you know, I remember driving down the roads and coming around a turn and seeing a car that had like flipped over on the road, just sitting there, like still. I don't know where the people were, but the car was just there. Nobody really seemed to mind. And getting off the bus in San Isidro, it's nighttime, it's dark. And I'm looking around thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, where am I? Where are my friends? And they finally come from around the corner. And uh, then it's, you know, 45 minutes to an hour up into, uh, up into the jungle from there. Because that's, that's the Cerro de la Muerte, right? The highway of death. Yeah, so I think we went down, yeah, we went down the road through the middle of the country and then dipped, uh, I guess that'd be west, into, uh, into San Isidro. And the first time I was up there, uh, no internet, no cell service. The only way you can make a phone call was with a calling card and the payphone in the middle of town. And the next time I went up there, like I remember... There was internet, but uh, I'd say that very loosely. Yeah. It was a USB drive on an extension cord with a, a paper plate with aluminum foil around it with the drive in the middle to get better, better signal. And I mean, now you go up there, you know, they've got internet and, uh, and cell service, but you know, that, that really wasn't that long ago. It's funny, you know, like uh, our grandparents or older, all, you know, had lived through uh, the Great Depression and talk about like no food. We're going to have to talk about like when the internet wasn't very good. Yeah. Yeah. I remember like AOL dial up, right? right. That thing to beep and the noise that would make. Yeah. Everyone knows it. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, how did you get from up in the mountains down to Capos? Yeah. So, after I graduated, uh, I never studied abroad. I was in such a rush to get out of college that I just like, that's what I, one of my regrets of like my education was 
not taking advantage of a study abroad program. So after I graduated, I wanted to go abroad, but also do something productive. So I wanted to come to Costa Rica and I found a dive shop here and I enjoyed diving. So then I worked towards being a dive instructor. So I was here for a couple months and it was the only place or the closest place to get up to where my friends live by bus was Capos. Mm -hmm. So that's how Capos came into the equation. And so what year then did you start living full time at Capos? Yeah, full time, I'd say probably 20, 2017 or 18. Um, after I finished the diving course, I went back and worked car sales. I'd worked on a on a dock at a restaurant at that point for like that was my seventh summer. Um, it was a great cushy job. And I did some car sales and was going back and forth for a couple of years. But then uh yeah, I'd say 2017, 18 is when I first moved back full time. And then what makes you stay? I mean, what's what's made you want to make a life in Capos? Yeah, I think the the people that I've met here are probably the biggest influence. Um, I'd even thought about living somewhere else. Uh, you know, when I was working at CRV, being able to travel around to all the different places in Costa Rica, uh, we got we went to Santa Teresa for a week and was like, wow, like I could see myself living here. But what it ultimately boiled down to was the community. And the people and the friends that I've made in Capos and this area here, which I think really make it hard to to go somewhere else or you know even go back to the states for that matter. Capos has always been one of my favorites. In the in Capos, everyone I guess from the tourist side, everybody thinks of it as Manuel Antonio. But what's neat about Capos is you have sort of Capos culture and Manuel Antonio tourist. Culture somehow it's it kind of works right like because you, you still have a decent bit of poverty in and around capos it's an old fishing town stroke i i suppose um pineapple and palm oil town right next to maybe top three most popular destinations in the country in multi-million dollar homes but somehow it works yeah i think the biggest thing here compared to some of the places where we're seeing it not work, like Nosara, for example. Good example. It, here, the, yeah, these multi-million dollar homes and these hotels are here, but there's no lack of housing for the, the people that work at these hotels, that clean these houses. And, you know, some of those really nice multi-million dollar homes are down in Capos and not up the hill in Manuel Antonio or in the surrounding area. Yeah. But, you know, you have Capos, you have, you know, Capos Centro where there's affordable housing. You have a Maculata, uh, you, and then now the roads paved all the way out to Via Nueva, mm -hmm. almost not a bad road down to Londres. And with the bus system, you know, there's really no lack of housing or area for the locals as well. And you can head up the mountain to them, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess it also helps that the agricultural companies way back at when put in a decent infrastructure. And so they're kind of, hit. there's always been a town. Um, in all your time in Costa Rica, what's changed the most? Besides the internet. Yeah. Uh, I think the the biggest noticeable change I've seen from when I first came here and to Capos in 2014 is the marina and how that's affected the local population here. Uh, and as it's continuing to grow, I think they're starting to enter phase, I don't know, two, three, whatever it is, to start building more condos, hotel. And really seeing that change from when I first came here, it was just, you know, two buildings with some stairs in between them and the outer ring. And now there's like almost 200 boat slips. There's shopping, there's more restaurants and, you know, a lot, a lot of change with that. And what, and throughout all that change, 
what are you concerned or what do you hope never changes? The, what I hope never changes is how open the marina is um, comparatively to, you know, other marinas in the area. There's a sense of exclusivity at those. And the marina in Capos is really about the local community as well. Uh, yeah. They have, uh, there's like a water festival. That's a big, uh, big, I don't know if it's a holiday. I'm sure if it, if it was a holiday, the government would make it one here. Uh, but, you know, they do like traditional dancing. Uh, for a while, there was movie night every Wednesday, and the steps were not packed with gringos. You know, it was a lot of local people here. They do a big Christmas light show that goes on. It's probably still going on now and, you know, draws in a huge local population. So, you know, what I really hope doesn't change is that the marina doesn't shift to being exclusive and that it really maintains that inclusivity that it's known for. I mean, I guess back to the theme of like what makes Capo so relatively, not relatively, a distinct and unique destination in Costa Rica is uh, ultra wealthy foreigners and modest means locals still hang out. They still congregate. Yeah, there isn't uh, a lot of the, the separation there or like, I guess like xenophobia exists everywhere, which in this case, it's kind of like against the, the locals in that matter. Um, but yeah, you don't really see that in, in Capos here. So now you are a proud homeowner. I mean, a true invested local is that having gone through that process, which I'm sure was quite torturous and you could do a full episode on, um, what do you wish would change? What do you wish, you know, what still needs modernization? I think more, more widely, like ease of, of planning. Um, you know, if I showed you the designs we had for the house, it's not very, uh, very detailed now granted like you can pay and get very detailed you know gigabytes of drawings but you know that's definitely something that at the price point i think would be a little more helpful uh, but you know throughout the process I was, I was very involved which is something that i really recommend to people either like be here or have a representative that only is working on your behalf to be here because like, so I, the way I did it was I paid for labor and bought all the materials and, uh, I would get a, a picture of handwritten stuff on a piece of paper of the materials we needed. And until I realized I could just forward that screenshot to country Plaza and have them put it together for me. Uh, you know, I was online trying to figure out what X is translating it into <laughs> that. But that was something that was also pretty uh, surprisingly like easy was once I figured that out, it made ordering materials, you know, pretty much seamless. Get them in by Wednesday. They're showing up on Friday. Neat. How, how brutal was your permitting process? You know, getting permits and permissions and whatever else you needed. Yeah, here it wasn't bad because it was already in a condominium. Okay. So all of that stuff was pretty much uh, pretty much taken care of. Right. What are the pros and cons of, of, of life in a sleepy little tourist and fishing town like Capos? I mean, if, if you have, what makes you want a Jones to leave? When do you need to get to the city? Yeah, what I miss is uh, food. Like, man, I love to eat. And do me wrong, there's some fun you know, places to go out here. But uh, being from the Northeast, man, like sometimes I just want a sandwich. Like it's just <laughs> a good, like it's so simple, you know, like I just want like a good, like roast beef from Provolone with some roasted red peppers, like fresh mozzarella sandwich. Like that's what I, I like. When I go home, I make a point to like go eat bagels and sandwiches, like Chinese food from the local <laughs> Chinese place. Because here, uh, you know, egg rolls are uh, tacos chinos, not exactly the same, that's for sure. 
Do you ever drive up the road to Hako? Are there more, more and better options there or is it about the same? Yeah, there, there's definitely some better options up there, but it's not like it's a crazy hike. You know, it's only 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, Puddlefish has a really good chicken pesto sandwich. Mm-hmm. Like I, I would take an hour drive for that thing for sure. <laughs> so you traveled quite a bit all over Costa Rica and you've, you've done your bit of fishing, I would assume, up and down the coast. What are your favorite places to visit when you're not in Man Antonio? But I'm not. My favorite place is probably the Dota area. Uh, we've got up there a handful of times. There's a really cool farm called Finca Las Mercedes. And you can stay in a 200-year-old casona there. And they do their own coffee tours there. And then there's the vineyard up there as well now. And, you know, it's only a two-hour drive and the temperature drops down to you know 60s 70s you want to have a fire at night that's probably our our favorite getaway second to that is probably going to visit uh, my friends up up in the mountains there and you know bringing up a couple kilos of pork and chicharrones and lots of beers it's funny everybody at the beach always it always uh longs for the mountains I guess, yeah, I suppose, just, uh, I suppose, and vice versa. You always want what you don't have. Grass is greener. So tell me about the inspiration for your YouTube show, Bizpirations. Where did that come from? Yeah, so being down here, I've met so many different people with different stories of you know doing their own thing. And I was like, well, like, these are, this is cool. Like, well, I could, I could put a podcast or a video interview show about this and see where it leads. So, you know, it kind of was an idea that I verbalized in February with a friend of mine and did my first interview in May. And yeah, I mean, at this point done 17, have nine ready to go out. And uh, the first two came out on January 6th. Really interesting, and the production quality is outstanding. It's one of those things that once you see it, you're like, how has this not been done before, right? It seems so obvious in retrospect, but I think it's really fascinating. And of those interviews, are there any that you found to be particularly compelling or self-motivating? Yeah, I think one of my favorites is this woman named Chelsea. She's a, She has a wedding planning company, and she was a civil engineer, cushy job in Boston, and always loved pastry. So she worked it out with her boss to go to pastry school, culinary school, a couple nights a week. And eventually just got to the point where she was like, I'm I'm gonna do this. And she was working, I think both jobs for a little while and then started, you know, doing pastry only. He ended up coming to Costa Rica with some friends from culinary school and they were looking for a culinary tour, which are pretty far and few between here. So they heard about the vanilla farm down in Villanueva. So they went there, did the tour. She started talking with Henry. Next thing you know, Henry is offering her a job to be the pastry chef. And she came down here, did that for a while, working for him and made cakes and then got into making wedding cakes. And eventually now she has her own, you know, wedding planning business and she lives down here full time. She still does pastry, plans weddings. And it's really a, a testament to show like, one, it's never too late to get started. And that, you know, you can do it. And since you've done almost, what, 20-some 20, 20 of these now? Yeah, 17 interviews so far. How, what, what's the common theme, if there is one? Have you noticed any common storyline amongst these folks? I, I think the common one is to, to have the vision and doing little tasks to get there. You know, don't try to get to the out. They don't try to get to the outcome from the from the get go. It's what can I do to keep moving myself towards that direction? 
and and the consistency of doing it. Now, what is it you think that draws all these expats specifically to Costa Rica? What is it about this place? Yeah, I think for some people, they, they just get here and they look around and they're like, wow, like I could call this home. <laughs> and uh, when you look at it from a, you know, like a political standpoint, you don't really have to worry about the government knocking on your door and taking over your business. So there's, you know, that stability, uh, the growing tourism. And I also think that one of the biggest things is just the culture of the people here are very accepting, inviting. It's not like, oh, like, go away, gringo. Like, what are you doing here? It's, uh, they're, they're very inviting and accepting and, and kind. You know, that's a word that comes up over and over, right? Like there's an, un there's an undercurrent of kindness here that's, that's uh, really hard to measure. But until you've been somewhere where it's not present, you don't really appreciate how bad it can get. Now, uh, it seems like it, even though people like to complain about petty crime and whatever, I think Costa Rica is still a I trust society. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I'm sorry, the the other thing, you know, it's like standard stuff. If you go to the beach, you know, don't leave your backpack on the front seat or, you know, don't leave your wallet sitting on top of your towel when you go into the water. But are you going to do that in Florida? You know, I hope not. Or if you do, it's yeah. probably going to be the same result. It is funny how sometimes people when traveling lose their minds, right? Uh, and, and on the reverse side of that question, what are the common misunderstandings that you've heard from these expats of like, I thought it would be easier. I thought it would be different. You know, usually somewhere in the old hero's journey, there's struggle along the way. Is there, is there some place where these people got here and get homesick or, um, you know, they're maybe got defrauded or, you know, the culture was trickier than they thought. Like, what are, yeah, the, what are the misconceptions? You got to have patience. Things do not move quickly here. And the the thing I always find funny is like you go to the bank, try to open up a bank account for a corporation. They tell you everything you need. You bring it to them. And then they say, oh, okay, now I need this. Right. And like you can't get frustrated. You know, double check if that's the only thing you need. But things uh, things move slow here. Things are not cheap here. That's, I think, the biggest misconception is when people think about how expensive it is to, one, uh, live here, uh, invest here. Like, it's not a cheap place, for sure. Not at all. And, uh, you know, I think you have to be mindful because if not, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not on vacation anymore. And it's very easy to get caught in that vacation trap there's plenty of places to go out, plenty of places to get in trouble. And there are lots of people that come down here and it just chews them up and spits them out and sends them back down the road. You know, the old expression was, if you want to be a millionaire in Costa Rica, start with two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are you working on next? Well, what's, what's exciting going on in your life? Yeah, so next... You know, building out this this Bizpirations interview series, and uh, as part of that, I've got a newsletter that helps promote it, and then also some business coaching. Hey. So, I actually met with uh, with Malena uh, last week, and I'm going to work with her for a year, and I've got a couple clients signed on from that, and yeah. try to build out that side of uh, of the business as well, and That's let right. that grow. Exciting. And you get back to the States much? Yeah. Yeah. I go back a good amount. I'm going back in a couple of weeks here uh, for my cousin's wedding. I'm going to spend about two weeks with my sister before then, go skiing up in Vermont, always make it home for Thanksgiving. And ma mainly I've been going back for weddings at this point. When's yours? 30, 32. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny question, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm 32 now, so it's like everyone's getting married. So I went back a bunch last year. A bunch of my cousins are getting married this year. So I'll be going back every couple months. 
All right. Last question, Jake. What's Pura Vida? When your friends ask you what the heck that means, what do you tell them? Oh, man, it means hello, goodbye. It's broken, but it doesn't really matter. You know, what's up? How you doing? Uh, I mean, there's so many different connotations and the different contexts, but, uh, but yeah, there's lots of meetings behind it. Well, awesome. Look, I always enjoy talking to you and congrats on the YouTube show and everything else you got going on. It's been fun to watch what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll have to connect and set, set some time up in San Jose. Anytime. Uh, man. With the video guy and then get you on there. Oh, that'd be great. Cool. Well, thanks for, uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. Have a great weekend. Let's talk tourism.